Hi everyone, it's Alex Sidrenko from Risk Academy and today I'm here with Hans Lisser from Aktush. Welcome Hans. Thank you. What is the what is the story behind your new company name? Well, I've been working as a strategic risk manager for 10 years at the Lego Group and uh, decided to make my own business and be my own boss, except for my wife. And uh, <laughs> found, was contemplating, what should I call my company? What's the, the idea behind it? And then I start looking at what's the philosophy that I want to convey, that I want to build on. And the philosophy is that activity, uncertainties they're a fact of life. Um, whether you want them or not, whether you're looking at them at them or not, they are there. So why not learn, train yourself, develop how to manage these, lead these, control these in such a way that they become an advantage for you? How to take advantage of uncertainty? I love that. You do it by ensuring that your maneuverability is better than that of your competitors. Uh, I believe that we have, in the past, a size was the big new black in businesses. If you weren't the biggest in your industry, find something else to do. Then it became outsourcing. And everybody, his grandmother, was outsourcing to Latvia and China and so forth. Now, you, today, you cannot build your competitive advantage on outsourcing because everybody knows how to do that. I believe the next five, maybe even ten years, maneuverability in a volatile world will be a key competitive advantage. If you're able to sail the super tanker up the Thames or 20 knots without hitting anything, you'll be much better off than the guys who can't. Now that may not necessarily be risk management, but it's all the risk management tools of uh, awareness, uh, early warning indicators and prepaid mitigating plans and business continuity, all those kind of things that can be used in strategic context to drive the company further than the competitors. Mm -hmm. It's a relative game. Yeah. You always have to win over competitors. And you cannot stand still. Uh, it's not it's not viable. Business development is like walking up a down, a down escalator. If you move too slow, you're moving in the wrong direction. So and if you stand still, you're dead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very true. And something that really attracted me to your work, and this is basically how we've met all, all mm -hmm. online, is that the concept that you used in the conversations when we're exchanging ideas on different articles is informed risk taking. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. As I said, the risks are there. Now, if you do like traditional risk managers, say, okay, we have we have this strategic aspiration, we have taken these strategies in order to meet the aspiration, we have initiated these and those projects and so forth, and then normally the, C, it's, uh, to the CFO will go to some poor sort and say, please manage the risks. You've taken all the risks. <laughs> he has taken, he has made all the bad decisions, or some of the good ones as well, but he has taken uh, some other risks. If you want to be truly maneuverable, you have to take the risks as part of it. I mean, I have yet to find any executive who will make a decision without talking to his finance guy say, what's the cost, what's the benefit? Mm -hmm. exactly. I would like him to talk to the risk man manager as well and say, what are the risks and how can I deal with them? To me, it's extremely simple. It's about three questions. What can happen? How important is it? And what are you going to do about it? Uh, please remember, simple and easy is not the same thing. Of course. So this is the idea that you have to build it in and take the risks that you can take and even invent the risk, create the risks that will make it, make it work. Make it worthwhile. Make it work. Ten years ago, well, it would be nice to be safe when the boat is rocking. And that would you build better and better safety equipment to make sure that you were safe if the boat was rocking. In a world of disruption, a world of change, somebody has to have the capabilities and the courage to stand on the side of the boat and be the one rocking the boat. And if you're that guy, you have a better chance than anybody else in the competitive world. Well, this is something you've, you've mentioned quite a few quite deep thoughts that I want to investigate further. So the first one, saying that um, risk managers need to be there when the decision is taken, not when the decision is already done and dusted and doing like post factum quarterly risk assessments. It, it's an easy thing to say, but that actually means a quite a revolution for the modern day risk managers because yes. we're so used to managing risks when it's time to manage risks. 
Yes. Which is relevant if the decisions are being taken every single day. So what, how, do, how can risk managers kind of transi transition to that? Pardon me. Uh, to me, the best way of doing it is when you're looking in, a, when you're part of an organization, working in another organization, there will be some executives who will buy into this and say, okay, it makes sense. If I have this guy help me manage the uncertainties, I can do better than I otherwise would. There will be others who think you're a total waste of space. But go to the first ones, liaise with them, and support them with everything you have to make sure that they are successes, that they convey to their colleagues that their success is based on, oh, but they had this risk and they thought about it, and they were actually hit by that one, but it didn't matter because they, it was mitigated, and we saw this opportunity, which we leveraged and actually materialized, so we came out with a target of 100 and a performance of 130. Uh, which no, nobody else have done because they're already looking at the downsides. So going beyond target was never the, never the plan. Build on that mm -hmm. and then have that executive be your third party advocate and gradually, but it's a slow move because essentially the tricky part is you go to an executive and tell them, I want to help you make better decisions. To many executives. Yes. Their first thought is, okay, you don't think I know my business, mm -hmm. and you don't think I know what I'm doing, and you don't think I make the right decision. Can you get out of here? Exactly. So it has to be done very, very delicately. Mm -hmm. And maybe I, the way I have done it in the past was that I prepared my behinds off uh, and took a 15 or 20 minute meeting with an executive, looking at a project, looking at an initiative, and I asked them to ask them questions. What about this? What about that? What about that? I'm sure you have it under control. How are you controlling this? Oh, by the way, he didn't have it under control. Great. Now you have the leverage in and say, okay, can we do something about it? Do you think it's important? Should we do something about it? And then try gradually to be their partner, be their help. Never, ever, ever take their thunder away from them because executives can't deal with that. They are executive because they want to be the spearheads, they want to be visible, they want to be seen. Otherwise, they've never gone for the job. It's bad for a lot of other reasons, <laughs> yes. working hours and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, so so uh, they are there for that reason. Mm. Let them have that reason. And then let them be your advocate around in their colleague. Group. Yeah. So I loved your analogy about rocking the boat. The analogy we use in, in, in Russia in the, in the courses that we do is... Uh, Risk management is like shaking the ladder before you climb it. You just see how stable it is. So rocking the boat is a, is probably yeah. similar to that. You're trying to rock the boat to see just how stable it is to achieve whatever that mission is. Now, just like this analogy is perfect because just like people would hate somebody who would actually physically rock the boat, just like that, people may feel very threatened or discouraged or um, may actually attack uh, the risk manager who's trying to shake the ground, trying to challenge the status quo. Asking those you know, tough questions or being the devil's advocate if, if what they had in, in Catholic Church. How can the risk manager kind of balance that challenging job of being the challenger and still maintain his sanity in life? Again, um, combining two things, finding the guy who buys into it, mm -hmm. liaise with him, start small, don't threaten. You, you can easily come up with a risk that will make him scared shitless, and that's not the point. Make some, give him something and then build gradually on that. It's a grad, it's a changing the mindset of people is a very gradual thing, yes, true. also because there's so many of them. Uh, so you have to do that gradually and take it one step at a time and and uh, be aware that you need the patience and those kind of that kind of leverage into getting the good examples getting the stories culture is created by stories anyway so it's about getting these stories into the organization mm -hmm. that will gradually change one guy or the next guy and when the project manager or some of the project managers becomes senior project managers and executives and C-suite people. One of them may be in the C-suite. He will have been growing up with risk management for the past decade, and he would never consider doing anything without it. Mm -hmm. Now you're there. 
Yeah, and that's a very interesting point. I mean, for, I'll, I'll try to recap on some of the very good ideas that you've mentioned. First is you can't really win everyone out. Risk management is just... Well, humans not inherently designed for thinking and managing risks as part of their day-to-day -day life activities. A lot in our brain tells us and tricks us into thinking that we're in control when we're really mm -hmm. not, and we get threatened every time somebody points otherwise. Uh, and instead of kind of aiming for everyone with an like, enterprise-wide risk, man risk management initiative, maybe the better way is to pinpoint some of the key decisions within the organization that may benefit from proper risk analysis and risk management. And you get people some senior executives um, getting this in the, in the mindset of thinking about risks and really supporting and appreciating what you do. I mean, we had with one of the board members, we had a funny saying is that um, we are applying risk management not with the board, but despite the board, despite some of the board members going violently against it because you know, risk management creates transparency. And transparency at the senior decision-making level is not always good for the decision-makers. They don't want to be transparent in everything. So we were doing it despite and against their will by having those small little successes, small little, uh, little wins. Now, another interesting thing is when you integrate into the actual decision-making, how important is it to speak the same language as the business person is speaking? How important is it to move away from talking about risk as being the vocal point and saying this is a high versus not a high risk to move into something that is actually meaningful for the that decision maker and something that is saying this schedule may be exceeded by X number of months. So talking in the words that the decision maker himself is using for, for that decision. How important is that? Well, my best description. Let us continue in the next five minutes. You speak Russian, I speak Danish, and see how many people get any benefit out of it. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, let's see where the discussion goes, because we won't be knowing what each other will be yeah. saying. It is extremely important. I mean, the life an of an executive is not an easy life. And it's not, they're generalists. And we have to face up to the fact that as risk professionals, we are not generalists, we're specialists. So we can deep dive into an area and has a lot of functional knowledge. Executives used to have that of some area, but could be marketing or HR or whatnot, doesn't matter. Today, they're generalists, which means that 10 minutes ago, they were discussing a fraud issue on a credit card. Now you're just talking about risk management on the strategy with them. And 15 minutes from now, they have a different meaning about the inventory level in uh, France. Mm -hmm. Their minds is all over the place. So if you have to take them into your realm and have them speak your language, you have wasted all the 15 minutes you've gotten. You have to go immediately into the language and see how can they benefit. The most important reason is using their language and focusing your message on how can I, the executive, benefit from listening to this dude? Because I'm actually worried about this fonts inventory thing. Yeah, the next um, so to capture that is uh, in, extremely important. Which is interesting you say that. It, it's the, There is the benefit of risk management for the organizational good, achieving better objectives, you know, meeting the targets. Um, but there's also benefit of risk management for that specific individual. Is getting his bonus payments, you know, not getting prosecuted, or getting budget approvals, or anything that may be the case. Maybe. Let's let's get this sequence right. Yes, it's the executive first and the company afterwards. It, exactly. But no exactly. executive is going to sacrifice his bonus for the benefit of the bonus of the company reputation or anything else. No way. He's and paid is, not to. Well, and exactly, and this is. This is exactly the point that I think many risk managers are fundamentally missing is that they come in to the table with a discussion, how can we all better achieve objectives? Only to realize that each individual is only thinking about his specific targets that he needs to meet. To Plus, they have a number of hobby horses. We have to admit that decisions on executive level are political decisions. Now, there's a lot of negative things about saying uh, said about politics and politicians and stuff like that. Let's go back a while. A political decision... No, rather, attend most decisions that we make, you and I, uh, on an everyday life, we can discuss an issue, we know we're here. We know we want to go there. We look at it and we discuss, and there are three options, options of we're doing it, and we can agree this option, a, option B is the better one, and we will take that one easy. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> political discussions, we are reasonably uh, aligned on where we are. 
That, that's okay. We know we want to perform better. We're not that sure we agree on what better means. One wants a higher growth, the other one wants a higher profit range, and the third one wants a better cash flow. We're not that sure about what that means. But once we've decided, okay, this is our aspiration, a 10% growth over the next five years, um, or seven years, which would double the company and two and a half times the bottom line and stuff like that. Now we have the aspiration. The COO wants to simplify so he can have the simplest operation possible so he can save money and that way create the bottom line. Mm. The sales guy wants more markets, yep. which disrupts the, uh, the, the supply chain. And the product development guy wants each customer to have their own products, which none of them, the two others can do. And they're all three options. And they have to discuss, how do we do this? And that's a political discussion. There is no right and wrong. There is no better way or worse way, at least that we know of. So they are in that problem solving issue of compromise, finding. compromise finding, which is a political discussion. And if we as risk managers do not recognize that complexity in their world of discussing, then we missed the boat. We missed our own opportunity because we were unaware of the problems of the customers that we are serving, the executives. Which is which brings me to a very interesting point. Um, there, there are a lot of people online who talk about how risk management um, is designed to meet the regulator's objectives and uh, the kind of the external world uh, or the board's uh, aspirations or provide transparency and the information to the board. Um, which is which to me personally is a bit weird because our customers are boards to a lesser degree and to a larger degree are the decision makers within the organization. We are we are designing our tools and our approaches to fit and suit whatever the decision makers need. I mean, it's interesting that it may take me months to help the decision maker to make a better investment or budget decision, but it will probably take me like 15 seconds to prepare something for the board, which will not be a lie, it will be truthful, but it's it's definitely a con con you know, condensed sugar-coated version. So wh where's that balance between serving the decision makers inside the company uh, whose interests are vastly different from the outside stakeholder realm mm -hmm. of risk management? If you just, if you serve the risk, uh, the the, the uh, decision makers well, then their decisions will be good, and then the board will be happy because the results will be merging out of it. It's a matter of sequencing of why or how things are happening um, in the world and how performance is created. The board may want transparency, and that's fine. But what they want transparency on is not how decisions are made. It's a, is this a good decision? Is this a safe decision? Have you done this? Have you done that? And then on the regulator side, a point of view, I challenged our uh, former, uh, at the legal group, um, I was met by our head of legal office. And he said, well, he was worried about the legislative risks. I said, legislative risks. I didn't know we considered breaking the law an option. The legislation has to be followed. I mean, it's just like when you look at finance, the CFO doesn't worry much, I hope, that the books are kept right, that bills are paid at this time, uh, that revenues are collected and stuff like that. There are people doing that. And the same goes for legislative risks. There should be somebody who makes sure that we do things the legal way. And there could, if big decisions are contradicted by law or in, uh, made dangerous by, or difficult by, by some regulation, then work with it. And, and deal with it that way. But just like Nord, everybody's talking about the finance guy being spearheading, a set number two in the company and spearheading all the decision making and all that stuff. Fine. The bookkeeping department is not part of that. And this is, I believe, funnily enough, one of the areas where I think we need to agree to disagree. Because you don't like the risk registers and you don't like the risk reports and you don't like the uh, risk tolerances and so forth. I believe they're the bookkeeping of risk management. It's not the CRO's that's, that's, job. That's a nice way of putting it. It's the bookkeeping of risk management. It has to be there. You have to know how much risk you're taking before you can discuss whether you should take on more or not. That doesn't mean that you're discussing the bookkeeping. It's just there. You have the data. You know what it is. And to me, on the risk tolerance thing, it's a matter of taking on more risks. I believe way too many people are cruising on the highway. They know there's a 75 speed limit. 
they have accepted in their minds that they will be going 85 because there's a risk they get a fine, but it's not that big. And okay, that's pay it and that's it. So we will go 85. The problem is they don't have a speedometer. And they know that 86 is totally unacceptable. So they'll be cruising at 50, 60, when they don't know what the speed is. As long as they're driving slightly faster than the others, they'll, they'll be cruising way too slow. And I see a lot of companies, not by any standards, meeting the risk tolerance that they have been given or have discussed with the boards, uh, because they don't know. They don't know how much risk they're taking. And they, to me, I use risk tolerance to, ex to exceed and extend and expand on the risks taken. Mm -hmm. I have actually, at the labor group, send an email to the C-suite at a point in time sales was sales projections were not quite in line with what uh, the targets were mm -hmm. and there was a risk that we won't meet the target um, at the same point we were not exuding our risk tolerance by any standards nowhere near mm -hmm. so I wrote to the C-suite in the middle of the year <laughs> hey guys you know what there's a risk that we won't meet our target and we're not using our risk tolerance. To me, the purpose of risk management is to make sure that we have a reasonable assurance that we will meet our targets. Yeah. So why don't you take on more risks? Uh, I have a couple of ideas here. I'm not a marketing expert, but I have a couple of ideas. You could do this, you can do that. It may not be as effective as we, what we normally do, but it could increase the likelihood that we will meet our target. Um, the CEO wrote back to me and said, uh, nice idea, it's not that easy. Uh, I've known him for a number of years and we have a good, uh, a good report. So um, I wrote back to him and say, if I knew the answers, you would have been given this mail from my own Hawaiian island because I would have been so rich if I knew the answers. I know it's not easy. Uh, the CFO came back with a longer discussion with pretty much the same sentence. Uh, and the chief marketing officer wrote back to me and said, I love it, keep it coming. Um, I never heard from the operations guy, but then again, it wasn't his area. <laughs> but, but then again, we never do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I did. Uh, I, I did when it was operation issues. Uh -huh. um, but um, on, on this particular one, how do we meet the sales targets? Of course, there's a sales guy who said, oh, I love it, let's keep it coming. They eventually did nothing, and they met the target. Now, Toys is a seasonal business. They met the target in the second week of December, <clears throat> one week before Christmas. Yeah, uh, that was a close, close, close call, yeah, close and call. it couldn't. It could have gone very much, uh, very badly because the Christmas, the in-season sales of toys is yeah. humongously large. That's actually amazing. I have a very similar story, but with the actual happy. Well, it will be. We will be able to tell in five years' time whether it was a happy end or not. But it was exactly the same discussion. The company had a board approved risk appetite, which was basically like a volatility between, mm -hmm. say, say five and 15%. And uh, at the time when they reported back to the board, they, they, they kind of the current volatility was about six, seven, maybe 8%. And the board said, but we've allowed you to take more risk. Why don't you take the opportunity? So the company actually ended up changing completely, drastically changing its strategy to become more risk taking, taking yeah. and uh, they've reshaped literally most of the front office departments to allow more risks to be taken take, take a more aggressive uh, strategy but to be still within uh, within yeah. the limits and risk was always there in the discussion to say well if you take this strategy this is how it will impact our appetite so they kind of they forecasted uh, yeah. volatility goes to about I don't know, 13 which is still below their threshold of 15, mm -hmm. which is amazing. This is an amazing example of risk taking, informed risk taking. Yes. We, we, this is how much risk we are taking now. This is how much the board has allowed us to do. Let's change our strategy. Let's change our... Let's be more ambitious. Let's yeah. be more ambitious. And it's, it's amazing. Because I see too many companies who basically are cruising on the highway at 50 miles an hour, and by the way, getting late for the party. Exactly. Why? <laughs> Absolutely. This, there's not enough discussion about understanding what risks we're taking and appreciating and, and recognizing and rewarding 
better informed uh, informed risk taking. And I wanted to kind of end up this discussion on, on on a quick topic. People are very important, obviously. Until we kind of get to the artificial intellect and we quantify everything, we're still relying a lot on the decision makers and on the human interactions and personal kind of feelings. So encouraging and reinforcing this culture of risk taking is is critical. Now, what is? Um, can you share like one example of where you've done something interesting, fun, that kind of got attention of uh, of, of people, and and made them realize that understanding and taking risks is a good thing for business and for themselves personally. Um, yes. We have a process uh, we applied at the Lego Group called Prepare for Uncertainty. I'm using it now in my com com company. It's a scenario process. Now, most times when you do scenarios, you do it the show style, which means I have this issue that can be, it can go to 100, then what? It could go to 200, then what? It could go to 300, then what? And you kind of build your scenarios around that and you have three different scenarios and address them and take a likelihood and all that stuff. Nice, but it's a one-dimensional track. And it's based on things moving in one direction. Now, when you're looking, talking about strategy, when you're talking about 2025, nobody knows about it, 2025. Or when you're talking about strategy moving into a completed new business area, like Google wanna move into cars. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have a lot of physical problems they never thought about in manufacturing cars, like gearboxes and transmission lines and brakes and stuff like that. So mm -mm, they don't know a lot about that. Of course, that they can buy, but uh, when you're talking about the future, there's a lot of things you don't know. Now, you have always made some assumptions about the future. What if they are not true? Roger Martin, in the strategy process, asks explicitly what has to be true for the strategy to be successful, assuming that you would then ask, if, but if it isn't, then what? What I do is I take, I have a number of uncertainties. It could be uh, retail. 2025, shopping is a fun event. Mm -hmm. It's a family event. It's something you do, you go to a shopping mall and you spend all day there because there's so many things going on and it's a social event and something you do with a family. Mm -hmm. Great. And the other end, shopping is dead. You don't do it. It's everything is online. Why should I spend time on something ridiculous as getting food? Uh, somebody, drone, some drone will send it to me. Both of these uh, worlds, or futures, are plausible. You can discuss from here to kingdom come what the likelihood of either one of them doesn't matter. They are both plausible and they're important to my business and how I make my cell sales setup. Mm -hmm. Super. Let's look at that. And then we can look at uh, green and and uh, environment and say, okay, 2025, green is still discussed. Everybody's talking about it, nobody's doing anything. It's just like the politicians have set up great targets 30 years from now when they are retired. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and nothing, doing nothing in between and saying that it's not saving money. It's not an issue. It's being discussed and there are academics and uh, elitist people who want to have it, but that's it. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. In the other end, Green is a must. If you do not have a green profile, if you're not CO2 neutral or better or this or that and this and that in your products and your way of doing things, <laughs> nobody's going to buy your product. Yep. Now, crossing these two and saying these two are the most important, you will probably have built yourself into a world where, well, there will be standard retailing and green is so important but not that much important. It's it's there and it's nice but it's not going to change the rock world. That's what you build your strategy on. Okay. What if you go in the other direction and say, A, it has to be green, and B, it has to be online? I'm not saying it's going to happen. We don't know it's going to happen. But which issues will it give you that you say, okay, I need to address that. I need to be prepared for that. And then you come up with a list of issues that you then prioritize, not by importance because they're all important, but by likelihood, do you believe it's going to happen or not? And by speed, if it happens, does it happen faster than I can react to or can I react to it as it merges? Then you get a model I call a PAPA model because it's about park, adapt, prepare and act. So that's kind of a PAPA. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you prioritize on that. And when I've done it, every team comes up with three or four, maybe five, act issues they haven't thought about before. Issues that they have decided are high impact, high speed, 
high likelihood, and we forgot about them. Yeah, because they came out of worlds or futures that we didn't really believe happened, but they could, and some element of it comes anyway. We better do that. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you strengthen their strategy. Um, the process is also described in a Harvard Business School uh, case study, and it's also described in the RIMS implementation guide as an appendix on how to do, how to do it. Um, it's extremely funny. And the good thing about it is it's a four-hour workshop. Four hours you're done. People are tired after those four hours, uh, but they've been working very hard. But it's a four-hour workshop where I, as a, my role as a facilitator, the risk manager role, is a facilitator role where he can challenge them and say, ah, have you gone far enough? Have you thought this through enough? Mm. Because people are more confident about their wisdom than what can be justified by facts. That's amazing. Thank you very much. This was very insightful, and uh, I've definitely learned a lot. I hope uh, our listeners have as well. Any last thoughts? Uh, any messages you want to give at the end? I will still build on the intelligent risk taking. Um, when you do that, it has to be intelligent, which means you have to know what you're doing. Uh, but you also have to take the risks. Um, prepare to dare. That's the only way to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time.